So my name is Francisco. I'm roadmap leader for for total and quantum computing at Cubeblocks. And I'm going to talk about things that may be a little bit uh, not so familiar for a lot of theory audience, but uh, hopefully you can get something out of this. So the, like, on, in, on, in, if you're running some quantum experiment, so on, on the one hand, there is the, the, the terminal that the user interacts with, and you want to do some kind of quantum algorithm, and I mean, here it's uh, just a very simple example. Uh, and then on the other side, you have the quantum chip, which typically sits in a cryostat, not for all qubit types, but there is some kind of chip, and you, you send actual pulses, uh, typically some voltage pulse or something like that, that goes to the qubits and actually interacts uh, to realize the gaze that you want to do. And as cube blocks, we sit in, uh, no, I need to click here. No. Yeah. Yes. As cube blocks, we sit in the middle. So there, there's where you have the control stacks, which is um, first of all hardware. Uh, so it's the I need to look here. It's really the electronics that uh, that that generates these signals that go to the qubits. This is just to show how it kind of looks in a lab. Like the the fridge on the right hand side is not so visible. Um, but we really connect directly a uh, cable to our, from electronics to the fridge and that uh, just generates these pulses. Uh, and then on the other hand, we also have some level of software that we provide to users to uh, like de define their quantum algorithms and, and then compile them down to the actual language of the machine. Um, so that's what we do. We create scalable control stacks for useful quantum computing. And uh, we are encompassing five fields in our vision. Uh, first is qubit tuning and benchmarking. So uh, you have a big chip, you want to characterize it, tune it up. Uh, and then we have HPC integration uh, and photo and quantum computing, where I'm going to say a little bit more in a moment, uh, quantum networks, and also as well, we're looking towards quantum sensing. And to say a tiny bit about uh, QBlox, uh, we are quite, quite a young company, so we were born in around 2019. Uh, it's a spin out of QTech, this institute in Delft, uh, which is fusion of TU Delft and, uh, and TNO in the Netherlands. Uh, and it's a very nice environment because we, are, we have many startups around us as well, that we have many projects collaborating with them. And uh, we are, like a year and a half ago, we were 15, now we're 65, uh, still growing. Uh, we are supporting about 100 labs around the world. And we are very excited that we're even moving to our own building since we have just outgrown the current offices. Um, I guess that's another new thing for us. It's a very new building. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we have, so we want to enable useful quantum computing, and we look at both directions of near scan full tolerant quantum computing in the sense that, um, we tr like, uh, I mean, NISC here means that maybe we can get away with uh, less qubits than quantum error correction, but then they should be pretty good. And instead, if uh, that cannot be reached then, or maybe even then, at some point, you, you, you just need to scale up the number of qubits to, to reach the full tolerance regime and have to do qu uh, quantum error correction. So I want to touch a little bit of these two directions. First, uh, just a reminder, so we are sitting in the middle where then there is an interface to the, to the PC, to the, to the software, and there is another interface down to the quantum chip. And uh, I'm going to first focus on this one, where uh, we're talking about order of tens of milliseconds to, to, to talk back to the, the host computer. Um, and so when, this, uh, when we look at this in the context of hybrid uh, quantum algorithms, there is a lot of back and forth between I have a, ch I have a quantum circuit, I run it, get my measurements, and then I do some classical processing. So in, uh, in this loop, uh, there has been like IBM that has been doing some, some measurements. And the point is that the circuit execution is that tiny bit amount of time but for uh, most of the time, the qubits are actually not really being used. They are waiting for the classical processing. And I think this is even excluding like the optimization part. It's just communicating to the electronics, setting it up, 
and actually start running the pulses and collecting the measurements. Um, so it's, it's quite a huge overhead. And our approach has been to um, make the first steps to, to, to make it better. And the first step is to characterize in detail the various steps uh, that happen in the electronics. And, uh, and we profile it with some software tool that, uh, uh, that is open source. We call it QProfile. Um, and I don't have time to go in detail over this. You, will, you can ask more to Kuhn that had a paper uh, yesterday uh, as well. Uh, I just want to say, yeah, that there's various steps to which is you compile, you prepare, not the, not the qubits, but the modules itself, and then you collect these measurements and so on. And so we did, here we've characterized it and then did two improvements. One is that with uh, active reset, uh, we save a lot of time uh, in, in, in terms of waiting uh, for T1 decay. And, uh, and then we parallelize the initialization of these modules. And, and then we have more to come, basically. That's, uh, that's our method to, to, to approach this problem. Um, then the second thing I want to talk about is the other interface, when instead this is at runtime, so you really need to be quick to be within the coherence time of the qubits. And I'm thinking about superconducting qubits, so uh, that's a few microseconds, so you need to be, you need to be pretty fast. Um, and uh, this is touching the quantum error correction, and it's a very important and uh, articulated topic. So we've been happy to engage with the scientific community. For example, we've organized a real-time decoding workshop at IEEE last year, from which then a, a review and perspective paper came out, also with some uh, colleagues from Riverlane. And uh, summarizing, there are two main uh, contribution to the total time for decoding. And one is the decoding time per se. It's a bit uh, clear that you need to be fast, needs to be scalable, still accurate as well. Uh, and in the paper, we have some review of the current literature that uh, is also impossible to discuss right now. Um, and then on the other side, there is the communication latency of measurement outcomes to some decoding module in the stack and then feedback back to corrective operations based on the result of the decoding. And that's where we really see our expertise as QBlocks and where then we want to collaborate uh, with decoder developers. Um, and um, I want to make you understand first what's the typical problem of other um, uh, solutions uh, for, for control, which is that they use, usually use centralized architectures and so, like, there is an FPGA that is controlling a bunch of digital to analog converters and analog to digital converters to send and receive the analog pulses to the qubits. Uh, but even if you take some fairly big FPGA, there is some limit on the I.O. And like, okay, four channels per qubits, there is some computation. It, it limits you to eight and maybe just a few more qubits uh, with this kind of architectures. But we, we, at Qblox, we have a distributed approach where we have many of these FPGAs that control a limited number of DACs and ADCs. And then importantly, the intelligence is really spread across all of these processors that are all independent. And then if you want to enable arbitrary quantum computations, the only thing you need to do is share the measurement outcomes across these modules. And that's something that we do with our uh, proprietary link protocol, which then ensures that we can do it uh, uh, fast within a few hundreds of nanoseconds. And this then uh, can scale to, at the moment, to uh, in the current state, to like 10,000 of qubits, which is going to be just quite a lot and is going to be enough for, for quite some time. Lastly, um, we are working then on, on a decoder module uh, to add to the, to the other modules that do the basic control of the and readout of the qubits. Uh, and so we are looking towards uh, to, to the two lines of collaboration. One is towards like tiers that have a decoder that are working on that, and that they're interested in actually running it on actual qubits, so that we can like work together with some of our partners or customers that have actual qubits. Uh, and then on the other side, there is uh, experimentalists who have well, do quantum error correction, then uh, we can uh, provide uh, like uh, to actually do it in practice. So I'm going to conclude with the two links to the decoding paper and to the Q profile paper, highlighting the ski projects. So I've talked a lot about quantum error corrections, but we also have worked with quantum networks in the Quantum Internet Alliance 
and uh, work for HPC integration for towards NISC applications. Uh, and yes, I'm just going to conclude, and you can uh, you're welcome to approach me or Kuhn or to approach us also by email. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Francesco. Are there any questions? This one over there. Hi, thank you. Just a few questions. First, is your espresso machine Italian? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit more about the synchronization of your control system? If you have a specific strategy to synchronize the two interfaces? Um, oh, so, so, so uh, 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 I think there's, there's one line to, to talk about the synchronization of the modules, and then, but then you, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, I didn't mention it. That's that's I think one of our strongest points. That when you have a distributed architecture, indeed, what emerges is that uh, all these modules need to be really synchronized to, 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 to be able to operate on the qubits at the same time. And it seems kind of trivial, but it's actually, it's actually, I mean, or, or not important, but it's actually extremely important. And so we have another proprietary protocol that we call SYNC, uh, it uses some internal clock and some handshake protocol to make sure that they all start like within the jitter of the clock, which is at the picosecond scale, so you will basically never notice that. So like, they, they are... between internal devices? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 all the modules are connected via the backplane, and so mm -hmm. the, there is some, some protocol that runs via the backplane to, to synchronize them. Thank you. I think for time we should move to our next speaker, but if there are any more questions, I'm sure Francesca would be happy to answer them in the break. Thanks very much. Thank you. Francesco again.